everybody happy wednesday hope everybody's doing well welcome back to the show so for this week i've got a guest on that i have not spoken to on this show at least for probably a year i'm thinking possibly more but uh, i'm really happy to have him on very happy that he agreed to be on and uh, everybody knows who he is he's been uh in the youtube community for longer than i have so without further ado let me welcome cheddar kung pal how are you man hey hack thanks for having me on glad to be here hey everybody in the chat it's awesome to have you on so we got nine folks in here at the moment let me say a quick hello we got dale palmer in here brian s nice to see you zach thong jp page two lars guitars dan in new jersey marco's images welcome everybody um six stream brian how are you there's mitch Heyman. so folks if you have questions for myself or for cheddar as we go on please lots of question marks in front of the question so that i can see it there's ed b welcome and yeah throw lots of question marks because i am streaming to everything <laughs> facebook youtube tw even twitch not that anybody watches on twitch but anyway and there's <laughs> papa blue and jeff k welcome Welcome, guys. There's Don. Hey, buddy. Nice to see everybody in here. Cool, cool. Half face. How are you? So, um, yeah, man. So, first thing I want to talk about is you've been putting out some very cool stuff. So, for those of you that don't know, Cheddar has his channel is back up. He's putting out some original material. <laughs> There's our buddy Chris Guitar Pit. How are you, Rick Hefner? Um, and uh yeah man some of your stuff is very cool and you're doing all of it in-house all the recording all the instruments so tell me a little bit about that man yeah so um when i decided to start putting videos back up the first thing i put back uh, i i reposted was um a cover i did last year that was on my old channel before i nuked it of a uh, buddy guy song uh leave my girl alone Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I recorded everything here. I think on that one, I used Apple Drummer. I didn't program the drums or drum myself. But yeah, I recorded on my Morgan with uh, SM57. I played that bass. Uh, I played my Strat. I'm just trying to get better at recording, get better at making music. hope people enjoy them. I've gotten a lot of really great support from the community. Uh, trying to do a mixture of covers and originals, um, but mostly covers at this point, because then I can focus on the performing and the recording and not add the difficulty of songwriting. But if I'm feeling inspired, I'll go for an original. Yeah. Have you done an original yet? Oh, Are yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I uh, There was one I posted two weeks ago called You Make It Hard to Love You. Or, okay. See yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was an original. Um, and, of course, I remastered everyone's favorite of my originals called Juicy Pinecone, um, <laughs> which is a, like a kind of a Weird Al type thing, just being goofy. Uh, but, yeah, I made the, the one I did a couple weeks ago called You Make It Hard to Love You. It's an original. Um, I play organ and guitar and and sing, and I think I programmed the drums on that one. I have an electronic drum kit you can kind of see the edge of right there, uh, which yeah. I'll play sometimes. But lately, I, I, I actually bought Henning's uh, drum course. He didn't give it to me for free. I bought it, uh, mm -hmm. paid the same as anybody else. And I, I went through Henning's drum course, and it, may, it gave me a lot of tips to make programming drums easier and easier to get good results at doing it. Yeah, well, my hat's off to you for that because, I mean, uh, to do all the recording yourself because 
you know, I like we were talking about uh, off air. Like I, I've done eleven songs, original material, and if it wasn't for my brother, who's the guru for drug pro uh, drug programming. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> we're all recovering from crack no. drum programming and uh and he he actually does the bass playing as well and uh and does all the recording and all that stuff and uh man and makes my stuff s- sound good so that's that in itself is a miracle so uh yeah my hat's off to you that you're able to do that all in-house so so what do you what are you using for like uh recording software and that yeah, so I'm using Logic Pro, but okay. um, you could get away with GarageBand. I, I switched to Logic Pro um, at some point, and I even forget now what the feature of Logic was that I really wanted. But there was some feature of Logic that I, I wanted that made me upgrade. But quality-wise, GarageBand will get you just as good of quality. Um, well, it's funny you mention that because everything that I've done is GarageBand. Yeah, there's no quality sacrifice with GarageBand. It's just you don't have all the features of Logic. Right. So, yeah, yeah, I'm using Logic. And then I think good microphones and a good interface are really, really key to good quality sound. Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned the SM57. Like, I have an SM57. And uh, I don't know. I, I think I might just have a bad mic or something. But it just never really sounds good. I ended up, and that's funny enough because when I do my record, when I do my recordings at my brother's place, we're playing out of amps, and he's throwing an SM58 in front of it, and I started. So when I did, like I did this big long demo, I got a Friedman Runt 20, which I told I told you about, and I did a big demo on the thing, and I got some really nice sounds and whatever, and that was all. Oh, you, you've got one too? Yeah, I've had mine for like four years. I want to say now three years at least maybe four yeah no they're they're awesome and uh yeah that's with an sm58 in front of a, you know in front of a finish 30 um have you have you ever since we're talking about the have you ever done the uh tr- ever tried the di out of that yeah i've used that before it's um it's kind of harsh sounding so when i've done that in the past sometimes i'll do the di out and then also do the SM57 in the front and put the SM57 like really off center so that it's warmer sounding. Because that's one of the things with with microphones is placement mean it, it means everything. Yeah. And so when I mix the DI out with an SM57 that's way off center, that SM57 is kind of warm, a little warmer sounding, as as warm as an SM57 ever sounds. And then the harsher. Uh, uh direct out sound mixed together i i, I kind of liked that that sounded good thank you all right now we're ready to do the show i got my tim horns <laughs> gotta have the timmies i gotta have the tims that's my trademark um yeah i when i whenever i um whenever i you know do live stuff and whatever i'm always using the uh the di well you can actually you can see the mixer in my sh- in the shot here this is mm-hmm. the Mackie mixer that I've got and I'll go DI into this and it, it sounds okay. But I mean, uh, like I, I was telling you, I just bought a new piece of gear and I'll be doing hopefully a re- full review and a demo of it. And I've been playing out of the cab. It, there's no comparison. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds way better out of a speaker than it does DI, you know, but you know, yeah, I, I really, really like the sound of recorded amps. Um, and so in addition to the SM57, I have a Royer R10 ribbon microphone, oh, which cool. that's like a $500 microphone, which is not cheap, but you know, it's still cheap as far as like serious microphones go, but that sounds really great. And so the way you can kind of see right there, the way I have it is the, the Royer is like right here and the SM57 is right next to it. And this mm-hmm. is something I copied from Josh Smith. He has a video where he talks about how he records and it's, I'm just copying exactly what he does, which is you have the Royer and you have the SM57 and they're both directly on the center of the speaker. And then you can mix those two because the R10 is a lot warmer sounding uh, than the SM57. And you can kind of balance your sound with those two. I usually just tend to have the Royer maybe three to six decibels lower than the SM57. And then that's usually how I get my guitar sounds. 
Yeah, well, the last one you did, the ZZ Top one, that Les Paul just sounded glorious. <laughs> Thank like, you. Holy shit. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. Almost as good as that one sounds. Right <laughs> almost, almost, <laughs> almost, almost. Good. No, you got that's an RO. I don't know. I think I, I think I told you that. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've, I've watched your streams with Chris and stuff. I don't remember if I saw the exact one where you announced it. You got it, but yeah, yeah. I called it uh, Holy Grail or something. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like it's Search of the Holy Grail. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've had my R nine since like the first batch of of the 60th anniversaries that Sweetwater got. It's funny because I I went and I played well when we were able to go out and play things. Uh you know when they came out with the version 1, version 2, version 3 of the 60. Mhm. Mm um and I haven't played one yet that's anywhere near as good as this one. I bought this oh, out really? of the guy's trunk. Like oh yeah, I saw that video where you went and got it. You, there was yeah. a video of you getting it out of the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I met a, I met um, this guy's in a, like I'm in Toronto. He's in Montreal. So it was like six hours. We met at the halfway point. I drove three hours to meet him just to check that guitar out, and I, I saved a ton of money. Yeah, a ridiculous price, and uh, I still haven't I still haven't found one as good as that. So uh, I definitely lucked out on that. So yeah. Uh oh, Paul, who's got a question? Uh, what model is the two rock? It sounds glorious. Oh, thanks. Yeah, and Brian S was asking about the two rock as well. So the, my two rock is a TS one model, um, which is a model that they first came out with the first iteration of it in like two thousand seven. And originally, this model started out as a limited edition, basically a clone of Robin Ford's Dumble which Robin Ford's Dumble is like one of the Holy Grail Dumbles, right? Dumb mm. Dumble Overdrive Special. But mine's like version four or something. I forget the exact revision number. I think it's version four where they, they've iterated on it since then. And so it's not like an exact clone of, of Robin Ford's Dumble anymore, but it is basically two rocks take on an Overdrive Special. Um, so it's a, it's a Dumble Overdrive Special style amp. Uh, it has a really, really great clean channel, which cascades into the dirty channel. So, you know, basically there's one EQ for both. And if you have the, if you have the clean channel turned up really loud, you know, that pushes the dirty channel more, and then you can control the gain and the, the dirty channel has a separate master volume as well. Um, and it, this one, the latest iteration has a tube buffered effects loop, which you can actually turn the tube buffer on or off on the, in, on the send and the return separately. And it has level controls for the send and return as well. So that's a really, really great, great effects loop. Uh, we got another question. This is from Michael MC. Josh Smith influenced your recording. Does he also influence your playing style? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think maybe I take some things from Josh Smith, some inspiration, but obviously I don't play anything like him. I mean, he's like a complete beast, right? Yeah, and, yeah. He, you know, he does a lot of hybrid picking playing and he, you know, plays lots of fast runs. And I mean, he, comparing my playing to Josh Smith is like, I don't know, comparing my cooking to some world renowned iron chef or whatever that no names coming to mind, but it, you know, he's one of the best guitar players alive today if not of all time right and yeah. so I, I i'm a blues player as well and actually josh smith i mean i i i know this is like a brag but i'm i'm a member of his like youtube rulers thing and i posted my original that i did a few weeks ago on there and josh smith actually told me that he loved it and he thought it was great so i mean maybe he was just being nice but yeah, he's an inspiration more than he is a direct influence on my playing, and he's he's amazing and awesome. And maybe when I grow up one day, I can play like him. But yeah. Yeah. so uh, when your videos and your drive, are you basically using uh, the drive on your amps, or are you using pedals outboard? So I do have some great pedals, but ninety nine percent of the time, I'm just using the drive on the on the TS one. It does have a FET boost, which is basically like a boost pedal built into the input, which is a feature that the Dumbles had as a separate input. You could like 
plug a lower for like a, a, a guitar with a lower output pickups, you could plug it into the FET channel and get it boosted up. This has the FET boost as like a button on the three button uh, foot switch for the amp. So you can just turn it on. And I'll use that sometimes to just like boost things up a bit. But mm -hmm. I almost never am actually using pedals in any of the covers that I've done. Uh, you can look, I always list all the gear that I've used in that recording in the description. So you can see if I use a pedal, it'll be listed there. But for the most part, it's just directly into the amp and just the amps drive. Cool. Cool. So since, since you were on the last, I think you did pick up a few new items. If you would uh, be kind enough to share those with the group and kind of get us back up to speed on what uh, what's in your arsenal these days. Yeah, so I'll go in chronological order. Um, do you want to see everything I have right now, or just the things that I've gotten since the last time I was on? Uh, let's let's focus on the stuff that you've gotten since. Okay, we'll do that first, and then if there's anything people are interested in seeing from the older stuff, I'll get it out. Yeah. So let me grab the first one that that I got last year around around this time last year. Microphone tried to commit Harry Curry. Uh, All that's, right. That's pretty. Oh man, let me let me uh, feature you if I can learn how to do yeah. that. Hang on a second here. No, well, not me. Why can't I do this? There is a way. Yeah, I know. Well. Hang on a second. Why is it not letting me do it? Oh, that's not what I want. Hang on. Let's see if the, the figuring in the neck can show up for everybody. Uh, Chris says talking? I'm going to drop it. By the way, again, hi to everybody in the chat. It's great to see everybody. Uh, for whatever reason, I can't. Yeah, you figure can't it figure out. it out. Okay. Yeah. Well, so this is a 594 graveyard, and it literally—I I don't know how well it comes across in the camera. I know it does look crazy in the camera, but this is literally the most insane top on a guitar I've ever seen in my life. It's really hard to. Oh, there, there you go. go. Yeah. So. It's the most insane top on a guitar I've ever That's seen. Gorgeous. And Quentin James, super chat from Quentin. Thank you so much, man. Quentin. And it has a figured mahogany neck. So you can see the figuring in the neck there. That's uh, sweet. And it's not supposed to have a figured mahogany body, but mine actually does have some figuring in it. You can kind of see there. Maybe even the, the covers for the electronic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. So, yeah, this... So the... There's a few cool things about this guitar, right? It's a, it's a PRS McCarty 594, which has been my favorite model of guitar for a while. This particular guitar, for anyone who doesn't know, the Graveyard Run is a run PRS did in 2018, and they announced it at PRS Experience, or Experience PRS 2018. And I was actually there at the factory for Experience PRS 2018 when they were announcing this run. And while this guitar was raw wood at the factory, I was there at the factory. Oh, cool. Yeah. So uh, I really wanted one of these when they were announced, but I couldn't afford it at the time. And uh, yeah, I feel bad taking it out of the camera, so I'll hold, keep holding it up while I'm talking. Um but last year, I found this one used. I talked it over with Chris a bunch and That's talked true. it over with a dealer. Yeah, Chris is an enabler. Chris the enabler. That's <laughs> a bad influence. And yeah. uh, I talked it over with a dealer, and I ended up trading three guitars for this and not paying anything except for shipping on those guitars. Nice. So I traded, traded three of my PRSs and got this. Um, That's cool. Yeah, I really love it. Um, one of the things that makes this different besides the insane top and it's all the insane woods. Oh, and it has, I don't know how it shows up. It has flame maple binding around the whole <laughs> neck and around the headstock. Oh. Um, but one of the things that really makes this different besides the crazy woods is that this guitar actually has like vintage nitro style finish, like, like our Gibson custom shops have. Um, and so this will relic over time and it just feels different um, than 
other kinds of finishes. The vintage style nitro just feels different and I like the feel of it better. And Chris says, how dare you blame me for that wonderful purchase? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the, this guitar is just awesome. You know, my other 594 was awesome. It's not like this really plays noticeably better than my other 594. It's just really, really cool. And I think it does sound better than my other 594 did. And mm -hmm. I like the way it feels and plays and looks better. Um, this top, as cool as it looks to you guys on camera, it's impossible to convey how cool it looks in person. If you ever get a chance yeah. to check one of these out in person, it it really is an insane top. Uh, the thing that PRS says about this wood that's in the top in the video about it is that like it's from a tree that was at least 100 years old. And so the theory is like that a curly maple tree that grows that, you know, for 100 years the figuring gets really, really crazy like this. You know, usually the trees get cut down a lot earlier than that. Mm -hmm. So That's yeah, I, I love this guitar. Favorite. Thank you. I plan to keep it forever. It's probably my favorite guitar though. The other two I'm going to show you, give it a run for its money. Should I move on to the next one? Yeah, let's go to the next one. All right. I'm going to see, see if I can see if the headphone cord will make it over there. To the closet. I don't know. That one's kind of hard to beat. <laughs> just saying. Damn. Well, that I do think that. Oh, there goes the microphone again. I do think that one has the craziest top. But so this guitar I got earlier this year. So after I traded for that graveyard, I didn't get any guitars for quite a while. But then I saw this Collings come oh, up. Okay. It's the Collings i35 Deluxe, and I so. To talk about the Two Rock a little bit more, that Two Rock TS1 I got because at NAM 2020 I checked it out. I was interested. I knew I was interested in one, and they had them there at NAM, and that was my first opportunity to really play Two Rocks. And I played through the TS1 prototype that they had there right. with Eli from Two Rocks, Collings i35, and from from then I knew I wanted to get a Collings i35, but I was looking for the right one, and then this one came up. Well, that's got some crazy figuring too, man. It does have quite a bit of figuring. Wow. Um, and it's got a really nice looking zero cote board and that those really cool parallelogram inlays. It has this ivroid binding all over the place. Um, so the deal with this is it's not exactly like a 335. So the top is actually carved out of solid maple instead of being laminate ply like on a 335. Mm -hmm. And the back is all carved out of one big solid piece of mahogany. One big, 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 big piece. Wow. In addition to that, this is 15 inches this way instead of 16 inches like a 335. So it's a little mm -hmm. bit smaller. Yeah. Yep. And the neck is, the scale length is a little bit longer. This is like a 20, 25 inch scale length instead of a 24.75 or whatever. So it's like a PRS scale length. The neck is thick as crap. It's, the thickest yep. neck I have. How, um, how, do you, how do you feel about the thicker necks? I I love thick necks. I actually find them much more comfortable. Oh, okay. Uh, my hand starts to cramp up with thinner necks after a while. Yeah, and this color is not a normal color that they make these guitars in. It's not. If you look on their website, you won't find this color listed on the website. So that was one of the reasons. Again, Chris was a wonderful influence in convincing me to get this guitar. <laughs> Let's just blame Chris for every guitar we buy. This yeah, right. Lincoln uh, statement done. Yeah, and uh, the pickups in this are Lawler Low Wind Imperials, and they sound really great. You can hear this guitar in quite a few of the videos on my channel. Um, the cover of Three O'clock Blues that I did with Rick Romanelli, I played this in that. You can that's I think mean, that's a great showcase for how this guitar sounds. Mm -hmm. So I really love this. Collins guitars are amazing. You may look at them and say, why does that cost even more than a Gibson when it, you know, it's a Gibson style guitar and they do make one of the, they do make these in the laminate style, like a real third 335. If, if that's more uh, somebody's interest, mm -hmm. but the, the level of like these, these, this guitar is completely flawless. Like it is, it's hard to convey how perfect it is. It really feels amazing and plays amazing and sound amazing. And the heel, the neck heel, look, like, look at that heel joint there. You see yeah, how it's like, you see yeah. how it's like curved and smooth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's like, it's, it's the best neck joint in the history of guitars. It's so comfortable. Yeah. 
and yeah so i would i would say check out the three o'clock blues uh cover that i did with rick romanelli that's a great thing to show how this thing sounds cool um should i show the third one yeah let's go for three and then if anyone's got wants to see some more okay. i'm right. keeping an eye on the chat thanks everybody for being here we got 41 people watching welcome everyone Thanks for hanging out. And this one's the most recent acquisition. Cool. Which you can hear in recent videos. Um, I've wanted one of these for a little while. This is one of the Paul's 85 guitars that they that PRS announced in November or so or October of last year. I actually had a pre-order with Ish Guitars for one of these, um, which uh, is Ish Guitars is where my graveyard came from, though I bought it used. So I thought, oh, this is gonna be so cool. I'm gonna have their Paul's 85 and I have their graveyard. Um, but th for various reasons that didn't work out and I had to cancel that pre-order. But I was able to get this this year. I traded in two guitars and some money for this. I don't think I've ever seen a Paul with Zebra pickups. No, this is the only one. This is the only Paul's guitar model with zebra pickups out there. It's the special run. They put 1985 on the truss rod cover, commemorating okay. the year that the the the, the factory, the first factory was created. Right. The top is crazy, like the graveyards, but I think the graveyards is a little crazier. But this one has more of a stain and a burst going on. Yeah, it's got more color. Oh. Yeah, the light's kind of washing it out in a way, but yeah. When it's a little like that's more this the way it looks right now is how it looks in real life most of the time. This is kind of washed out. So this doesn't have a figured neck or a figured body really. Uh, this does have the vintage style nitro. It does have flame mahog or flame maple binding just on the neck, not on the headstock. Uh, it has vintage style tuners. It doesn't have locking tuners, but. This guitar sounds amazing, feels amazing, and plays amazing. This actually has the best feeling neck of all my guitars that I've ever owned, probably. That's their pattern regular neck on that? Uh, it's the pattern neck, which is thicker than the pattern regular and wider oh. than the pattern regular. So, it's, it, so the pattern neck is like the old wide fat neck. It's like a pattern thin, but it's a little bit thicker. It's, it's only an eighth of an inch thicker, or there's even, I think it's actually only a sixteenth of an inch thicker than a uh, pattern thin neck. What are the pickups in that, those zebras? So these are the, the, the Paul's guitar pickups, which are narrower than a regular humbucker. Mm -hmm. um, this, they split with these little mini toggles. And okay. when you split these, they really become single coils. The, a few years ago, they did a video talking about the, the, the first T round of TCI pickups and how when you split these pickups, it actually takes the other the other coil completely out of the circuit. It doesn't just ground it out. So when you split this, it really does hum and everything. I was saying the other day how the only guitar that I've ever played that had that was able to do the split pickup thing and, and not lose any volume, like where it was actually 100% usable, was uh, I had a PRS. It was a CE. Uh, mm -hmm a while and uh yeah those pickups were awesome mitch has got a question for you he's asking can you ask dave what he thinks of the new mark Lettieri signature guitar it looks really nice yeah the prs fiore um it, it's pretty interesting i haven't played one i haven't tried the neck or anything it seems like a nice companion to the silver sky in that it's a hss it doesn't have a pick guard it has a two-point trim instead of a six screw trim it's like a, a little bit more of a modern style strat than the silver sky um i have to play one to really have a strong opinion on it it looks cool uh i'm sure it's well made prs doesn't put in put out anything that's not well made really whether it's for me or not it's going to depend on how the neck feels and everything yeah it's um i mean i saw well phil mcknight did a. Uh... Mm -hmm. back between that and the silver sky and then it definitely had a fatter tone to it than the silver sky 
Yeah, the Silver Sky is definitely going more for a vintage thing, right? It's like meant to replace. Yeah, exactly. It's, and it was specifically meant to kind of be all of the best aspects of John Mayer's two favorite strats combined, right? Which was like a 63 and a 64 that he had. So it's really tr- the Silver Sky is really trying to be like a 63, 64 strat. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I've not played the Latieri one, but I've played a bunch of Silver Skies. And it's just every time I play one, it's like, yeah, it's a great strat. Yeah. <laughs> that's basically it right yeah i had one i had a really cool one with a flame maple neck um but i ended up selling it because i love my strat that i have um and i think i actually prefer the sound of my custom shop strat to the silver sky Mm -hmm. not the silver sky didn't sound great also but i just happened to like my strat better than that but that that particular silver sky so that's cool all right, so that's the th- three guitars I've gotten since the last time I was on. They're pretty, uh, pretty uh, cool guitars, though. So I'm making up for the slower rate of acquisition with cooler guitars, I guess. Hmm. No, oh, definitely nice guitars, definitely. Yeah. And this one you can hear on quite a few songs since I got it. There's a video where I'm improvising with this. You can see in the thumbnail on the ZZ Top cover I put up on Sunday. This is what I use for the solo. So, yeah, yeah. Well, I love the sound of the Les Paul on that, but I'm biased. <laughs> yeah, in the left channel. I'm biased in that regard. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. So, um, yeah. Getting back to the so we were talking off air, and uh, I I was saying to uh, to David that uh, I mean because you know. I, I've been aware of you for a while and, and uh, watching your videos and that and how your playing has just really been excelling and, and, and getting better every single time. And um, so we were talking about, you know, music and composing and this and that. And you mentioned that you did some, uh, uh, did, uh, did that one. Ori- I didn't, I, I should have known that was an original song that you mentioned earlier, but uh but let me let me ask you getting you know totally let's you know talking about music a little bit so what's when you're when you're trying to compose something or make you know what what's your what's your process are you just like noodling on the guitar and oh man these chords sound really nice together or and then you know you get lyrics to come off of that or is it is it more sort of thought out yeah, so I have a whole whole bunch of voice memos on my phone of riffs. Which, do you sing, sing riffs into your phone? Do you do that? I don't sing them, but what will happen is I'm playing and I'll I'll play something that I like, and I'll be like, "Ooh, I like that." I don't want to forget it. If I don't record it, I will forget it. And even right. if I record it, I forgot it. And I I couldn't tell you what any of these are if I just go through and look at the thing. I'm not going to know what it is till I hit play. I have a terrible memory for just riffs outside of a song. I can remember songs, note for note, every word, no problem. But riffs outside of a song, I can't remember. Um, So if I come up with something I like, I just put it in a memo. But I have not really turned those memos into songs. Like the the original that I have out there, um, the You Make It Hard to Love You, I was like, let me just write a blues with with a really prominent organ part. And um, and it actually started out with the drum beat. I was like, well, let me try programming a drum beat, see if I can program a drum beat that I'm happy with and see what I can turn that into. So I programmed the drum beat of that song first. And I was like, ooh, I like this. What does this feel like? Well, this feels like maybe an or- a blues with a prominent organ part. So I looped the drum part for 12 bars, and then I tried playing a blues progression. You know, we all know one, four, five. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, and, and I, I have my... Nord right here. I don't know if you can, yeah, you can kind of see the edge of it. Yeah. So I have my Nord right here in this desk. And so then once I had the drum part looping for 12 bars, I uh, started f- fiddling around on the organ to come up with a, a nice way of doing a blues progression, right? Because, because the, a 12 bar blues is not a, necessarily just one thing, right? It's all how you play it. You know, it could be a shuffle. It could be anything. So Based on what the drum beat was, I was like, okay, uh, here's here's kind of what I'm feeling. And eventually I came up with the organ part that I liked. And then from that, I was like, okay, 
what kind of lyrics and I wrote the lyrics afterward. So that's how it's been for me really is like, I come up with a, with a musical part that I like and build from there. And the lyrics have been so far for me, the last thing. Yeah. Uh, here's a jumping back to guitars for a minute. Uh, day DR guitars. Hey Dave, how are you? Is asking, what do you guys think of the Joe Walsh making the jump to PRS? Um, I, you know what, when there's money to be made, people are going to jump to different brands. I mean, I'll use the example of Paul Stanley from kiss uh, that guy's had un, been under more guitar brands and I've changed underwear. I mean, <laughs> somebody <laughs> offers, him, offers him a check. He's there. So he started with Gibson. Then he went to BC rich. No, sorry. Gibson. Then he went to Ibanez. Then he went to BC rich. Uh, then he went, uh, then he started playing the Ibanez again. Then he jumped to Washburn and now he's backed with Ibanez again. So there you go. So whoever's got the biggest check, that's where you're going. That's my take on it. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, it could be money driven or it could be like, that's what he's digging right now for whatever reason. You know, some people just switch guitars all the time, you know, like for, for six months, this is their favorite guitar. Then for the next six months, that's their favorite guitar. So I, it's hard to say. I don't know Joe Walsh, so I don't know which what what's the more likely scenario for him. I mean, I do think 594s are great. Obviously, I have one that I love. I do yeah. think R9s are great too, though. Um, that particular Joe Walsh 594 is really interesting because outside of private stock, it's the first time a PRS has had stainless steel frets. You've been able to order that as an option on private stocks, but there's never been like just like a normal guitar, you know, for under 10K that's had stainless steel frets. And it also had um, a Brazilian board, which is harder and harder to get on a PRS. And if you want a Brazilian board on a Gibson, you're going to pay 10, 12K for it. Um, and then also it had the vintage nitro finish, like my 594 and like this guitar has. Um, so that's like three kind of private stocky features that it had. And it was 6,500 bucks, which is a lot of money, but it's like, you know, half of what you would pay for a private stock with those features. Right. So I'm not, yeah. it seems like they've all sold pretty much. And I'm not surprised. And I imagine they'll become collectible pretty quickly. Marco's images is asking, uh, is the pro junior a really great living room amp? I haven't had, I haven't owned a pro junior, so I don't oh, have, okay. I have a, I, so my little fender right there is a champ. It's a, it's 57 custom champ. Um, that's a great home, like living room amp because it's five Watts, little eight inch speaker. Um, if you're just wanting something to noodle on, you can play cleanly on it pretty quietly and it still sounds good. Um, and then also it will do that champ thing of where when you overdrive it, it does that sound, that tweed overdrive sound. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And then, so getting back to the, the, the music, so you're laying down a part and then the, the solos when that you're playing, are you, uh, are you basically pre-planning these or are these off the cuff? The Always. The always totally improvised. Um, I, you know, I can play a solo that I've learned, right? Like I can be like, uh, right. I, I can play note for note, whole lot of love or uh, black magic woman, but that's not how I play my solos. I just improvise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we were talking too about, you know, I just, uh, this afternoon I signed up for another, uh, guitar course with Steve Stein. Uh, I'm taking, for those of you that if anyone is looking for, uh, guitar courses, and again, I'm not sponsored by anybody, but guitar zoom, which is Steve Stein has got this crazy deal right now. They're like 50% off on every course. And I just purchased one this afternoon, something for me to learn on the summer, and the guitar course is melodic soloing. So uh, hopefully that'll make me a, a better player. Um, and uh, 
that's kind of what I what I need to focus on. And you were saying that you're signed up with uh, True Fire. Yeah, I really I mean, Steve Stein's great. And he's a really nice guy and a great teacher. So I don't mean to say like do this instead. Do both. Do as many things as you can slash want to. Um, but yeah, I uh, I've been signed up with True Fire's All Access Pass for like three years. Um, it's like you can get it on sale for like a hundred bucks a year. And um, it gives you access to literally all the lessons that they have on there, which is you could spend the rest of your life doing them all. There's so many and a lot of them by really, really amazing musicians like Robin Ford, Josh Smith, Kurt Fletcher, uh, Matt Schofield, like, you know, tons of great players and then tons of other great players who are less famous and also great teachers like Jeff McElaine or Corey Cungliano. I'm so sorry. I probably just butchered his name. Um but yeah, the, the True Fire just has basically infinite lessons. So when I'm hankering for a lesson, hankering, who says hankering? Did I just fall out of a time warp from like 1940? Um, uh, I'll, I'll log on to True Fire and, and do some stuff on there. Yeah, yeah. No, I, uh, I, I, I like the way Steve does in particular because he kind of has an ability to bring information down to a level that i can understand and kind of go from there and uh you know it, it's something that you can latch on to right away and you can you can make it as difficult or as simple as you want really in terms of you know getting technical and theoretical about it so so it's very very uh he's very good for me in that regard Chris had a good burn on the Walsh guitar. He said it's a twelve thousand dollar private stock, but you get a fifty five hundred dollar discount because it says Walsh on it. I mean, he signed it too, so maybe it's a signature. Maybe he counted it as him defacing it. I don't know, man. You know what? That's the one thing with signature guitars. As much as I like, let's say I don't know, Rockstar A has a signature guitar. As much as I like the guy, or I'm a fan of the guy, or the gal for that matter. I don't want their name on my guitar. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or or put their name on the guitar, put it on a truss rod cover or something that I can replace. Unless it's Les Paul. Well, okay, that well that goes <laughs> yeah. But you get what I mean, right? Yeah, like, yeah, you know, no, no. I, I only own I only owe two signature guitars. One's Hennings, which you know, that's my friend, and then the other one's Les Paul. That's my signature guitar. Well, I guess this is kind of a signature guitar, but it's not really. But I mean, it's the guy's company, so you, yeah. you fully expect PRS to be on there somewhere. Yeah. But yeah, you know, it, it, I I don't know. I think that that that's a deal killer because you might want all the features on that particular guitar, but you don't necessarily want. Like I remember Joe Bonamassa had, and I love Joe Bonamassa. I'm not saying I don't, but he had his name like right down the fretboard. I'm like, you can't. Mm -hmm. What are you gonna do? You know, like. You, you're gonna go and play a gig, and people are gonna say, "Oh, hey, I like that Bonamassa guy." I'm like, "It's not me. I'm just playing the signature guitar." <laughs> if I recall correctly, they they sold two versions of that guitar: one with his name and one without his name. Guess uh, which one's more collectible? Guess which one's worth more? <laughs> probably the one with his name because they've sold fewer of those. I would imagine. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I, I was I I was guessing the one without his name is probably harder to get your hands on, but you could be right. Uh, Michael MC is asking, have you tried the Tommy Thayer Epiphone? Uh, no, I have not. Um, I would love to try the Tommy Thayer Epiphone, but, uh, it's never, uh, never been in a store that I've had the, uh, chance to pick one up. Yeah. I haven't been to a store since, I mean, I haven't, yeah, I haven't been anywhere where I could play other people's guitars, you know, not my guitars since NAM 2020. So uh, I am going to Nashville in June, so that'll be an opportunity to try some other stuff. But I'll probably be going to Carter and whatnot, so might not get a chance to try any new things. Oh, Carter's well, no, Carter's got new stuff and old stuff. Do they? I thought they only had old stuff. I think they had some new stuff there. I don't know. Brian S is in here; he can correct me on that. But um, uh, Carter's is great. Uh, I was at Carter's in twenty. Uh, what year was that? No, 2019. Yeah, because 2020 never happened. So 2019, yeah. uh, I was there, and uh, the, the one, the one really cool place. Okay, so if you're in Asheville, right, you've got Carter's, you've got Gruen's, and you've got 
uh, Rumble Seat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to go to Rumble Seat this time. Uh, Carters will let you pick up and play anything. Like, literally. I mean, we were playing an, uh, um, a 335 that was worth, I don't know, a ridiculous amount of money. Again, Brian would remember. Uh, or, or Brian S., the three of us were there. And uh, they would let you basically play pretty much anything. Um, Gruens, I did get, got a real bad vibe from them that they basically didn't, <laughs> they didn't watch anywhere near their stuff. Um, and Rumble Seed was very cool. Rumble Seed is like a hangout. Like you literally show up, you know, and just shoot the shit. And it's almost like a museum. And if you want to buy something, it's there. So Rumble Seed had a really, really cool vibe. But I would say out of the three, if I could only go to one, I would definitely go to Carter's. Yeah, Carter's where I went last time, and I bought a mirror there, a core mirror there. Um, okay, so the twenty. Okay, so the Gibson we played, Brian us is saying it was twenty eight grand. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it was the whole. You know, my my quest when I was down there was to uh, to hold, or you know, not necessarily play, but just to hold a fifty nine Les Paul. And I did see one, and it was actually at Rumble Seat, but it was behind a glass case, and it was like 10 feet off the ground. So that's the closest I got to a 59 Les Paul. But it uh, would have been nice to, uh, nice to pick one up. And, and I, talked, I told this story before, um, but when we were walking out of Gruen, so I had met, and all three of us had met, Joe Bonamassa the night before, right? And the next day, we were coming out of Gruen's, and there's Joe Bonamassa walking in. So I met him again, quick handshake, how you doing, whatever. And he went in there, and just before, you know, he walked, he got out of a, a truck. He was with a buddy. And I see him pull, a, you know, just check his money roll. He puts his hand in his pocket, and I could see the biggest roll of hundreds you've ever seen, right? <laughs> you know? And uh, he went into Gruen's and obviously he bought something. We were on our way out. We weren't going to stalk the guy, whatever. And then that same day in the evening, uh, Brian and I are at a, um, at a cigar bar in Nashville. You know, we're sitting there having a couple of, and I'm, I actually was doing a live stream, which was funny from the cigar bar and who walks in, but Joe Bonamassa, <laughs> <laughs> he walks in where he, Hey Joe, how are you? And he sits right you know, the table next to us and we're, you know, talking to him or whatever. Turns out they wouldn't give us the time of day at Gruen's, but they had the time of day for Joe Bonamassa. And he, that he walked in and what he, he bought a, an Esquire, a Fender Esquire. That's what all those hundreds were for. So, yeah. But uh, unless you walk in with a hundred dollar bills, I don't think anyone at Gruen's will give you the time of day. That's the vibe. I yeah, I've, I've heard Gruen's not the place to go unless you're really interested in buying something they have, you know. So I was planning on skipping Gruen's. Yeah, Carter and Rumble Sea would be the place. But is I thought you, you're, you're not talking about going to NAM though, because I think they canceled it this year again, didn't they? I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm not going for that. Vanessa and I, my wife and I, got tickets to see uh, Tedeschi Trucks Band oh, um, cool. in um, Murfreesboro. So just outside of Nashville. So we're cool. going down there for that. We're going down for the weekend to go to that show. We saw them at the Ryman in 2018, which was awesome, but it's going to be outdoor this time. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of Tedeschi trucks, you know, you're missing in your collection. At least I don't see An SG. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really like SGs. I don't find them comfortable. They sound oh. great, but I don't find them comfortable. I mean, this this is a double cut. This is as <laughs> close as an SG as like I need. An SG, right? Yeah, this yeah. is my this is my SG. That's how we're gonna play it. There you go. Actually, yeah. my Ted McCarty is probably my my SG. That's uh, so that's short shorter scale length, like a like a Gibson. This is the PRS twenty five inch scale length. Right, right. So, anyways, folks, if anyone's got any questions, throw some question marks in front of your question, and I will forward them to. Um, to cheddar so uh can you ask cheddar to rank the least favorite 20 kiss <laughs> all right let me just pull up wikipedia here kiss discography <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, so guitar pit i've uh, done that show already and uh, 
yeah yeah actually i got a show coming up in a couple of weeks that'll be uh five five albums from five bands that summarize those bands so if you're interested in that kind of content we'll have that in a couple of weeks for you and i won't one of those bands will not be kiss because we did kiss the last time <laughs> Brian says his S2594 thin line is his SG. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Gruens has a reputation sometimes being a little cold to people browsing, but I've never had any firsthand experience. Uh, BC Rich 581. So uh, I guess Brian Cote, Brian Stewart, and myself look like uh, homeless people because when we walked in there, they wouldn't piss on us if we were on fire. So. <laughs> They were like these. These, I mean, you. We were there for Nam, right? So they were probably getting a lot of tourists with no interest in buying. So their patience might have been thin. Well, you know, it was culture shock, right? Because we had, we just come from Carter's, and they were like super nice. And then we walk into this place, and it's like, yeah, oh, they're man. like f off, dude. Yeah, I, I felt like I had to grab this. I mean, it's the hack show, right? So I got to pull this guy out. All right, I got to feature this one because this is important. You know what? That looks an awful lot like mine. That yeah. looks a lot like mine, Cheddar. Yeah, man. The back I mean, is kind of, I don't know. Yeah, you can kind of see how the back has faded a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you could tell that neck's a lot fatter than mine. But in yeah. terms of the top, that's real close to only. Yeah. You know what? You got almost a quilty thing going on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mine is more flamey. Yours is a little more quilty. And this is eight pounds, even. Yeah. So you know what? Here, I'm going to show you mine up close. See if I can feature myself here. And you tell me how close this is to yours, because it's pretty damn close. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're like sisters almost. There you go. So I don't have the quilt. I've got straight flamage. Yeah, but similar coloring. Very, very similar coloring, yeah. Yeah, that's not the course. And then I got a little bit, you know, the nickel aged on it a little bit. And you can't see it in the camera, but there's just a slight amount of checking going on. Mine doesn't have any checking yet, but one day I'm sure it will. You know what's funny is we've had a few power outages at my house since I've had this. Um, and I thought, you know, one of those power outages, it would end up checking because, you know, some of them have been in winter, in the dead of winter, and the house got down to like 35 degrees in one of them, but it's not checked yet. Well, when I got this one, it was, it, this is aged. Mm-hmm. So it came with the ch I didn't. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, it was not something that happened over time. I haven't had it. I've only had this. I got this last summer. Last summer was like the quest for the RO, and I gotta blame Brian S and Dave. Those guys are. You think Chris is bad? Those guys are major enablers. <laughs> but um, yeah. So that that was that was the the search for last summer. Uh, Jerry W is asking, "What year is your last Paul show?" It's a 2019. It's uh, one of the 60th anniversary R9s. It's from the first batch that Sweetwater got of those. You can see it actually has like the four digit mm -hmm. serial number, you know, the nine and then four digits. They sold so many of these things that they went to five digits, but you know, which is not realistic and real ones only at four digits. So mm -hmm. I kind of, it, it's, it's, it's very superficial and pointless, but I like that it's one of the four digit ones. Yeah. It's, it's silly that, uh, Somebody that we know that's in this chat, full bears. I mean, I don't know if there's any any reason to get a examination mentally. Uh, well, maybe he just wasn't, you know, enough of a, a player to be able to handle a guitar like this. Maybe that's what. Yeah, it that's it. That's right. You can't <laughs> handle the truth. <laughs> I yeah. mean, that neck joint is for serious players only. Correct. <laughs> You are correct, sir. <laughs> yeah. Shaggy wasn't me. <laughs> was me. I think it was. 
All right, we're getting up to the hour here. Let me know if anyone's got any uh, last-minute questions for for David. And in the meantime, uh, folks, if you'd like to um, subscribe to uh, Cheddar's channel, the links are below to his. Uh, the link is below for his his YouTube channel. Go over there and subscribe because he's putting out some really great sounding stuff. So your his recordings are awesome, his tunes are great. So check that out. And if you'd like to help support the Guitar Hack channel, um, I have links below. I have merch. There is T-shirts. There are hats, hoodies, mugs, all that kind of stuff. There's also a PayPal that would be very much appreciated. And if you don't follow me on Instagram or my Facebook group. All that stuff is below. Go have a look. Check it out. Let's grow this thing. That would be all very much appreciated. Brian S. has got a question. Guitar hack. Oh, what gear is Cheddar gassing for? So what's next on your radar? Well, I mean, that Paul's 85 was eating at me for about six or seven months, but I just got that like a month ago or something. Um, so that's that's quelled the guitar gas for now. Um Amp gas? The T honest in all honestly, I hand to God that TS1 has quelled all my amp gas. So uh, you're gonna sell all your other ones? No, I love them, but <laughs> I don't see a point in selling them. But like it really is exactly the way I want a guitar to sound. Oh, thank you, Zach. Zach said that it's awesome to see me back. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate everyone joining us today. Um yeah. Mostly what I've been thinking about lately is more recording gear. So this desk that I got has uh, eight U of rack space in it. And right now I've just got my Focusrite Claret interface in there. I kind of need another interface if I want to be able to record stuff and have it like come out into a stereo pedal and then back in. I've got almost all eight inputs on this one occupied already because my keyboard uses two, the two mics on the cab back there use two more um there's two on the front one of which is this microphone i'm talking to you through the other one i use for diing the bass so i'm like only have two inputs left that aren't accounted for right now right um so i could really use another interface for in order to like send stuff out into pedals and back in like you know for a stereo reverb or a delay or anything um and then beyond that i've thought about like other recording gear like um you know better mic pre's um that's another rabbit hole right there man when you start getting into the recording stuff yep it's a crazy rabbit hole what are you using for monitors uh so i've had these focal 65s shapes or focal shape 65s i forget the or correct order i've had these for quite a while uh, i think i got them in 2018 maybe 2019 no i think 2018 um they are fantastic monitors. And when I got this desk this year, I got stands for them. And let me tell you, I was doubtful of how much difference it would make. So they used to be on my computer desk, like both on my computer desk with my computer. Mm -hmm. And now they're on stand, separate stands. So they're isolated from each other. It made a huge difference. They, they sound so much better on the stands. It sounds like mumbo jumbo. It sounds like bull crap seriously if it, like anyone out there who like really wants to do home recording and it's taking it seriously and like doing their own mixing and really wants their stuff to sound the best it's really worth it worth it if you can do it to put to have good monitors and put them on stands and isolate them it, it made a notable difference it's like like my eyes aren't that bad i i can legally drive without my glasses but when I put my glasses on, everything gets clearer. And it was kind of like that. It was like going, it's like, you know, if YouTube loads something in 720p and you switch it over to 1080, it was like that kind of difference, uh, putting the, the speakers on stands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I know a couple, why not one guy that's just starting into the recording thing, right? Cause you know, he, and he's asked me for, well, I can't tell him, but I, I you know, directed him to ask my brother questions and stuff. And, you know, it's like one week, oh, I bought this. And then the next week, oh, I bought that. It's like, man, you realize <laughs> you're going into that because that's a whole other type of gear, gas. Yeah. Hole, you know. Probably the most likely next thing for me is an acoustic guitar. 
and or slash a better vocal mic, um, like a, a, a nicer Neumann or something instead of this mic tech that I use. Acoustic guitar, are you talking like a full body or not, like yeah not a dreadnought but like a triple o 28 or a triple o 28 style from laravee or somebody the best acoustic i've ever played was a martin triple o 28 that i played at elderly instruments in 2018 so 2019 i think it was 2019 yeah it's 2019 and i should have fucking bought it sorry uh i should have bought it and uh i didn't Cause it was three grand and I wasn't, I didn't go in there planning to buy it, but it was the best acoustic I've ever played. And I so regret not buying it. Collings also makes acoustics. Yeah. Yeah, they do. They're very highly regarded. So with the trip to Nashville and me th thinking I need an acoustic, that's kind of a dangerous combo. <laughs> yeah. And you're going in a Carter's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. That's crazy. All right. Uh, let me know if anyone's got any last minute questions. We're at the hour. Wait a couple of minutes. Is there anything that you wanted to mention? Anything upcoming in the meantime? Um, I'm I'm gonna uh, I'm just doing covers or originals every weekend. That's my goal. If a weekend is too crazy, I'll just do it in an improv track. Uh, I'm not really doing gear reviews and stuff anymore because uh, that made YouTube feel like a job. I have a video explaining why I deleted my channel and everything and, you know, how I'm, uh, why I'm focusing on music now. So I really appreciate everyone who's been so supportive uh, in welcoming me back and resubscribing and everything. And, uh, and for you having me on, Hack, I really appreciate it. No, man. I mean, you know, like I was saying to you off air, I mean, the, the sort of the bottom line, all this was, you know, kind of welcoming you back because I mean, you know, I, I, in other forums and things that I get involved with, when I mentioned that I was going to have you back, they're like, Oh, great. You know, Cheddar's coming on, you know, it's glad to, glad to see him back on, you know, and start the channel again and back in the community because you were missed. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, I mean, I, I saw your video, why you, you took everything down and all that, but, uh, you know, people wanted you back around. And so uh, when you agreed to come back on the channel, I thought, uh, you know, that's awesome, right? That, that to me, that tells me that, yes, you are back and, you know, you're, you're, you're among, you're among us again, which is awesome. So that's, that was sort of the whole idea of having you on the show. So. Oh, I really appreciate that. And like, yeah, if anybody's interested in my music, please subscribe. And uh, I really appreciate the support. Links below, folks. Links below. I, I'm right. proving every week that really expensive guitars can get played and used for music. They don't just have to sit <laughs> on the wall. Yeah, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, that, that sort of, that, that kind of hits me where I live, you know. <laughs> My channel is called Guitar Hack not guitar expert, not guitar professional, not guitar. I know everything and you know, nothing it's guitar hack. I do this as a hobby. I do it because I love it. Mm -hmm. I have guitars. Okay. Because I love them. You know, I don't collect stamps, <laughs> I don't collect, you know, vehicles. I, I guitar and I don't collect the guitars cause I play them and I, I play them and I do recordings and I do original music and, God willing, before I die, I'll do another bar gig, you know, but I mean, I use them. <laughs> so that's the end of that. It starts and it ends right there. If Absolutely. you don't like it, shut the fuck up. <laughs> okay. Amen. Amen. Yes. All right. And with that, I'm going to bid everyone. Hang on, uh, David. With that, I'm going to bid a dude, everyone. Have a great rest of your week. Uh, I can't tell you what's up for next week on the show because I'm still waiting on some responses, but uh, there will definitely be a show next week or maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. I'm waiting on responses. But anyways, everybody have a great week. Thanks for joining us. And uh, okay, cue that up. Yeah, and we'll see you all soon. Take care. Cheers. <laughs>